Hello, I'm Meg Martin, Executive Director for Interfaith Works. I am super happy to be here today doing Lean in Olympia. It feels like it's been a minute since I've done one. I don't know if that's true or not. It's hard to even know what is time anymore these days in pandemic life. Um, but I'm so glad you all are here. Welcome to Lean in Olympia, a live bi-weekly show airing on the second and fourth Tuesdays of the month. Um, Lean in Olympia is a show, as many of you know, that features conversations at the crossroads of humanity, justice, and belief. If you want to check out past episodes, we just had our one year of our first episode last week, and um, our amazing friends at Porcupine Media put together a really cool highlight video of it. So if you want to get a vibe of what the show is like, we really would love for you to see that. Um, but you can check out past episodes on our website, interfaith-works.org, as well as following us on Facebook and YouTube. So today, um, I'm really happy because we have our guest, Sam Miller, who's here with us, which we're going to talk a lot. Um, and it's kind of a bit of a different episode, I feel like, because usually we have um, folks who come on our show for very specific reasons or maybe because of the role that they play in the community. And that's true today about Sam, but also I feel a little bit kind of like more raw and vulnerable today than usual because um, we are coming up on an annual event that is called Overdose Awareness Day, and it happens um, internationally on August 31st. And Interfaith Works is going to be doing a little bit more about that next week, but I invited Sam here today to have a conversation with me um, about what it's like to be people who have both um, experienced overdose in various different ways. Um, many of you know that I have my own longtime history with substance use. It's something that's been part of my story as becoming director of Interfaith Works and the work that we do in the community. Um, and Sam also leads with his personal story in the work that he does as a stand-up comedian here in town, as well as somebody who's been um, working in the social services field for a long time. So um, the other thing I want to say is that I also am coming up on the one-year anniversary of my cousin, who was my dear friend. Um, we grew up together since we were little babies. Um, twin flames, as my aunt, um, his mother always says, and he passed away from an overdose last year, um, this coming Saturday. And so this is just a very personal episode in a lot of ways, and of course has so many intersections with the work that we do all the time. So thank you, Sam, for yeah, being here. For me. I felt like I should have talked earlier. When no, like, it's okay. We have Sam here, and I should have been like, hey, but then I, I just waited. I just Because I just kept on rolling. Yeah, you, yeah, know? you were cruising. <laughs> this is live? Um, well, actually, if we're going to be honest, we are pre-recording this. <laughs> <laughs> but usually the, yeah. it's on Facebook Live, but oh, okay. because of scheduling today, we had to do it a little earlier than we usually do. Oh, okay. That makes yeah. me happy. But no editing. So if I say anything like, oh, no editing, okay. Yeah. I won't say anything super wild. Yeah. Keep it clean. Yeah, I will. I will. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry about your cousin. I didn't know it was a, it was a year. So. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, well, and that was a great introduction. Yeah, I'm Sam Miller. I'm from Olympia, Washington. I'm six foot six. I'm 360 pounds. I've been married 10 years. I've been clean and sober for 13 years. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I got two kids and one of them's on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> and you just started to pursue comedy full time, right? Yeah. Two months ago, um, I made the jump into full time comedy. I still work one day a week at a, uh, center for unhoused youth, a service center. We're not a drop in center anymore. We're a service center now for unhoused youth in Tacoma. And I worked at the, uh, the Beacon Youth Young Adult Shelter, um, all mostly throughout the whole pandemic. Mm -hmm. I was actually planning on pursuing stand-up comedy in June of 2020, but that went all the way sideways and uh, did not happen. So it's been the last two months have been great. They've been really scary, but I've had like a lot of support from the community, 
and that's really all I need. So I'm good to go. Like between, I'm making ends meet. I sell t-shirts. I've haven't embraced capitalism, but I'm giving it like an awkward side hug. <laughs> <laughs> and Sam and I have known each other for a long time, more so in recent years. But um, I remember back in the day when Sam would your your big your hot gig downtown was that you would balance gigantic objects mm -hmm. on your face. Mm -hmm. That is very true. Such as kayaks. Shopping carts. Shopping carts. Running lawnmowers. <laughs> <laughs> riding lawnmowers. Not riding, oh, running lawnmowers. Oh, I was lawnmowers. like, dang, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, even, I did a moped one time, and there was a bunch of gas spilt on my face. <laughs> I was like, I need this. This isn't any way to live a life. <laughs> I gotta but also kind out. of freebie. Yeah, it was. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, uh, I supported myself um, a lot of times while I was unhoused. Uh, by doing like party tricks and crap like that and trying to make myself welcome in places where I didn't have anything else to add to the situation or else I felt like I didn't have anything to add to the situation. Yeah. I've always felt kind of left out, you know? Even yeah. Now, so. Well, would you... I had originally thought it would be fun if you started with a little bit of comedy because I think humor has been absolutely a key tenant in my recovery from substance use and um i know that it has been for you too but i'm wondering if before we do that will you just give like the few minutes of sort of your a little bit about your story of living on the streets in olympia and what that what that looked like for you yeah um so myself like my uh, I'm I'm a bit of an outlier, um, being as it, I was uh, I was raised in like a middle class. Like I I'm, I'm not there's two you know as you well know there's there's two types of uh, of poverty. There's generational poverty and situational poverty. And uh, my experience with poverty and, and being unhoused is is the situational type. Mm -hmm. So um, I started. Um, my dad passed away when I was 12. At that time, I was already um, drinking and using substances, inhalants mostly. And uh, it was a thing where I think I was always had issues. Mm -hmm. um, and it's weird that drugs and alcohol, as opposed to like getting me high, I always felt like they kind of just made it so I could keep up with everyone else. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that after my dad died, my mom is, a, is an amazing lady. And we live, we, we, we bought a house four years ago in Tumwater Lake. She lives below us, it's going very well. But she was kind of a pushover. And uh, yeah, I was off to the races. I moved to Lacey when I was, uh, I think I was 13. Mm -hmm. And my substance use went up and my incarceration and treatment center intakes went up. And, uh, and yeah, it, around, I think the first time I was unhoused. And it's weird too, because as you know, and a lot of folks, I don't know how much of the, public understands this all the way but like um i didn't see myself like when i was living in a car um i didn't necessarily see myself as experiencing i didn't think i was experiencing homelessness i was like all yeah. right you know living in a car or like living in a i've lived in abandoned houses yeah. and i didn't see myself as unhoused then i just thought i was getting a slamming deal on rent <laughs> and uh uh yeah so from the time i was 18 to 25 I spent probably about three years, you know, and it's weird because, um, that number has gone up because I realized that there was times where I was, um, living on couches. I lived in a, in a barn loft on the West side of Olympia for a while. Mm -hmm. And it's funny. I told my mom, uh, cause my mom is, she told me, she's like, people ask me like, how long we go? Oh, it was two years off. She's like, it was longer than that. So my mom <laughs> says, and then, and then I go, no, nah. I was like, what, when I was like living in a barn, I was like, a barn's a home. And she's like, for a cow. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, my, my deal was my, my mom said I could stay with her. Um, if I could, uh, if I could get clean and not use, I shouldn't use that term, but if I could, if I could stop, um, stop my drug use that I could, uh, I don't like to use the word clean because I don't know. I'm trying not to use it as much. Uh, Will you say a little bit more about that? That's one of my, one of my things too. It just, you know, 
when I'm around other folks in recovery, I don't mind saying it, but yeah. I think it, it puts the wrong idea out there that um, because there are different types of recovery and like abstinence only has really um, has really become like a uh, a goal. And it honestly, it, for a lot of folks, it does make sense mm-hmm. for um, complete abstinence, and and uh, for some folks, it's 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 too much. And, uh, and also that there's plenty of folks that, uh, including some very good friends of mine that don't, um, practice entire abstinence and, and live very, very amazing lives. And, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, I think for me too, it's like, what's the opposite of clean? Yeah. 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 And, and then also that the idea of being clean is such like a, nothing is clean forever all the time Mm -hmm. there it's always like sort of a temporary state right like we have to wash our clothes we have to like wash our bodies we have to like you know like we're no one's ever like clean or you're not clean it's like this and so I feel like it sometimes gets utilized in this way where it's like a there's a beginning and an end or something to being either clean or the opposite of clean which has a lot of connotations for what that might mean when it's assigned to a person right but i think that also it's important like you said when you're around other people in your closer like recovery circles yeah that people get to define themselves how they want to like yeah. i sometimes have called myself you know like referred to myself in different situations as being like a recovering junkie and that's something yeah, that yeah. like other folks might find really offensive but it has helped me in different ways. Yeah, I'm the same way. I I, don't, I use uh, I use the term tweaker, mm-hmm. and um, I don't like it when other people use it. Sometimes, especially people that haven't experienced. In fact, it's it's it can be really really hard for me to hear people use that term sometimes, because um, I remember being ostracized for yeah my methamphetamine use, and there was a certain amount of ostracization. Is that a word? Yeah, it <laughs> that, is. Uh, sometimes I get lucky and I say a word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that should have taken place because I was, um, when I got caught up, so that's, you know, I didn't, so the end of my story is I got caught up with methamphetamines and, um, uh, methamphetamines made, methamphetamine made great sense to me for a large portion of my life. Um, I don't regret, um, using methamphetamine. Um, I regret some of the things I did to get high and I regret some of the things I did while I was high, mm-hmm. but honestly, like, uh, a large portion of my life was spent like deciding whether or not to, um, I was suicidal constantly. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I was playing this weird game where, uh, between my trauma, uh, incarceration, mental health, and the, um, the effects of like my substance use disorder and like trying to juggle those like, like balls mm-hmm. and, and to keep myself alive. And that was the, and that was my life for a, uh, for, for years, yeah, for years. And that's what, you know, and that's, what's so strange now about doing comedy is because like so much of like what I talk about on stage is like these kind of funny stories. And that's the other thing too, is I really like to say this and then I'm going to shut up about this. Is it like, um, it wasn't all bad. And when I was locked up, it wasn't all bad. And when I was on the streets, it wasn't all bad. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the thing is some of the most amazing, beautiful people I've ever met were people that I was on the streets with. Mm-hmm. And some of the most amazing times I ever had were times that I had while I was on the streets. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I hate it when it's like, oh, this, this poor guy, this poor guy. It's like, man, kick rocks, man. I miss parts of it sometimes. You know what I mean? Yeah. At least I didn't have to clean out cat boxes and... <laughs> like do this other bull crap and yeah. listen to the HOA. <laughs> <laughs> so of which I became president of. I want to say really. That. You know about that? No, I'm not anymore. Yeah, for two years I was president of my HOA. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. I know it was rad. That's amazing. They made me walk around like I had to walk around and look at yards, and I'd be like, <laughs> like Is how, how the yards look. I'm like, well, none of them got cars in them. <laughs> Must You're be like, doing all right. Check. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that that is such an important point that you're making of just like, I just feel like we have this way of looking at addiction in society. I mean, also, okay, another thing I want to say to you about this is that 
why it feels so important to keep talking about addiction openly in our community to me is because I don't think that it happens very regularly, even though there are so many people who are struggling with addiction. I find that often the conversation around addiction in our community is intrinsically linked to the conversation of homelessness in our community as well. And I recently did some, I was just like, you know what, this is just, there's something that feels like it's not adding up to me. And I looked up on the SAMHSA, so the Substance Abuse Mental Health, oh gosh, I never remember the full acronym. Um, It's SAMHSA, I thought. SAMHSA, yeah. Or is it SAMHSA? I think, uh, whatever. It's SAMHSA, but I think it's pronounced SAMHSA, but it doesn't matter. Um, But there are like hundreds of thousands of people in our country who have substance use disorder. So that's people who have sought treatment, gotten a diagnosis of substance use disorder, right? So you think about how that's even probably just, that's folks who have access to mental health services, who have access to healthcare that are getting recorded in that way for having, and that's so many, like hundreds of thousands of people in our country, right? Um, And then there's significantly less than that of people experiencing homelessness. And I did like a little bit of math on those numbers. And even if every single person experiencing homelessness had a recorded substance use disorder, which we know is not true, 100% of them, it would still only represent 3% of the overall population of people in our country who have a recorded substance use disorder. Yet, when we talk about addiction, it's often like so often coupled with the conversation around homelessness, we are having this like hyper focus on the people with the least amount of resources to help resolve whatever addiction struggles that they're going through. Meanwhile, there are hundreds of thousands of people living in houses, living all among us who are like really struggling and dying from overdose and um, all of those things. And yet we can't like seem to have a more honest conversation about that. And in this, um, in 2020, overdoses were up like 25%. And in the first quarter of 2021, they were up 40% from the first quarter of 2020. So it's just continuing to to go. Yeah, between the the heroin epidemic, um, the recession in 2008 that we never came back from. Well, I mean, Wall Street came back, but... uh, the the people in this country didn't come back from um and now what whatever it's going to look like on the backside of covid or um it's uh yeah yeah and i agree you know i've made this point before i don't i don't know i'm not trying to be like uh what's the word i'm not trying to be like bombastic or anything man i've been using great words today yeah you're really doing good wow listen to me uh but the main issue I see with the reason that um, unhoused folks are demonized for substance use is because it's visible. And the reason it's visible is because they're unhoused. You know what I mean? And it's yeah. like, uh, and the other thing too, and you know this, is that um, there were times where I would use more because I needed to stay up at night. Yeah. Um, because I didn't have a place to sleep that night. I didn't want to, I didn't want, cause it was a little bit, um, when I was, when I was unhoused in downtown, I was, uh, 2002, 2003, 2004. And, um, it was a different scene altogether. Like, uh, there were, uh, you had to be a little bit more careful, uh, than you do now. Uh, as far as, I used to worry about uh, law enforcement a lot and, and mm-hmm. things like that, you know, as, mm-hmm. as far as where I was camped. But uh, the it's hard to tell how much – I have no idea, and there's no way to ever know, but how much of my homelessness was due to my substance use and how much of my substance use was due to my yeah. homelessness. Because it all just kind of uh, – for me, it wound up in, like, a bigger ball. But like you're saying, too, is, like, I knew a lot of folks out there there's a lot of folks that um, that were substance use didn't seem to be like their main deal. Like I can't tell anybody else what their deal is, but like 
a lot of folks it's more like just like uh mental health like schizophrenia things like that like uh people having psychotic breaks and then there's a lot of folks too where um it just seemed like hard luck like they might have a couple beers or something like that like they drank like like soccer moms like it was not like yeah. uh, they had their sub- substance use wasn't a deal for them at all you know they're just like right. working and not making enough to afford housing and yeah that. yeah and and it's the strangest thing too because um those are a lot of the times those are folks that i knew from before those are folks that i knew from like out in lacy and things like that that's another thing that that always kind of surprised me is that like um when people say it's like oh people are coming from out of town they're coming to olympia that was not my experience like most of the cats i i knew like there was a lot of folks from lacy Mm-hmm. Tumwater, Shelton, like like cats from Lewis County, uh, Mason County, stuff like that. You know, like they might come to Olympia because there might be some more services here. But like that's another thing I hear a lot that makes me kind of cringe. Yeah. Is it, oh, they're coming from all over the country to Olympia. It's like, have you been to Olympia? <laughs> <laughs> like, you want to come here? Like, man. Well, yeah, and even if, like, even if that were the case, it gets really dicey to try to game that strategy out right like yeah. oh, okay well only so then what we only provide services to people who've yeah. been here for a year or longer yeah. what if they're elderly what if they're pregnant what if they're you know like whatever there it starts you start to be like oh, how yeah. do you game that strategy out anyway yeah I um, agree. well one of the things that and this is like i don't know feels like maybe a more vulnerable thing that I struggle with as being somebody who is, has been very like vocal in public over the years about my own struggles with mental health and substance use is that it's really hard at times to be like seen as someone who got better. I don't know. Does that resonate with you at all? It does sometimes. Yeah, it does sometimes. So part of the thing that <clears throat> that happens when I uh, when I go on stage, I always I pretty much always do the same opener. Uh, my first joke and I talk about how I've been sober for 13 years and then I show everybody my belly tattoo. And I'm not going to do it because this is like a professional thing. But like uh, I have a tattoo on my belly that says, let's dance. Uh-huh. And I talk about how I never enjoyed dancing. And uh, <laughs> I should have gotten a tattoo that's like, hey, Scott, is it too late to call your cousin about that methamphetamine? <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't have enough. I only had enough for nine letters <laughs> and one sky comma, because that's what I call apostrophes. <laughs> uh, and then I talk about, um, it's, it's so wild. When I actually sit here and just talk about the things that I say on stage, it seems so wild. Like I, I talk about like smoking meth out of light bulbs, which mm-hmm. is not something it's like, it's terrifying because mm-hmm. light bulbs have like mercury in them and stuff. Yeah. I'm more worried about smoking meth out of light bulbs than I am about all the other meth that I smoked. Like, uh, it's really bad. The light bulb thing. You Much get, higher risk. Well, mercury, <laughs> uh, like it's that, that mercury poisoning is terrifying. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah. I put myself out there. I put mm-hmm. myself out there really far. What I worry about too is that um, I don't want to be the uh, the the face of uh, the face of like recovery or the face of uh, of of that like kind of bootstrap kind of like obsession. Of, yeah. um It's funny because we talked on the phone last night and um, it brought up like uh, I stopped and I got noodle soup. I, I did a show in Renton last night and I stopped and I got some noodle soup in Tacoma on the way home and I was sitting there and just just feeling like this uh this form of gratitude that's that's hard to that's hard to explain but with that gratitude comes guilt Mm -hmm. and uh that I uh I don't know what happened I don't know how to this day I don't know what snapped in my head that that kind of gave me the kick enough to 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 seek out because I've I sought out help for addiction before, but what changed in my mind is like all of a sudden I got enough of a kick to stay consistent with it. Yeah. And um, what was different this time is it um, a 
lot of my cravings were were lifted. Like I'm a fairly spiritual guy at times, and that's kind of the only reason why is that I still don't understand why that why that switched for me. And yeah. um, a thing too is it. So I was raised like middle class, and like I said, my mom she would let me stay at her house if I could stay sober. And uh, I don't think I could have done it without that. And that mm-hmm. a lot of the people that that I'm around and a lot of the people that I see um, in the encampments now, they don't, they don't have a safe place where they can be fed, cared for. Like it was like, it was, it was four or five days of, uh, it was, it was really hard the yeah. first four or five days. Um, coming off a of crystal is weird. Like, um, it's, it's, I don't think it's nowhere near as bad as coming off a of heroin, but like, uh, it was always a strange experience for me because, um, I'd, I'd, I'd sleep, uh, but it was always like this, uh, almost like this crushing sleep where I would, uh, it was like I sunk into my mattress like so far and like, yeah. it was so hard to get up and, um, getting up and eating and having like my, my digestive system, like, like in turmoil, like trying to, trying to eat food and then, um, and then this kind of overwhelming sadness um, would start to set in, and it would build by by day three or four. I'd just be so depressed and and just bored, and um, and out of place. And that's when I when I sought out like a recovery community mm-hmm. that worked for me, you know. But um, the uh, there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of a lot of guilt there's a lot of concern mm-hmm. that um i can be used as a uh i don't want to say tokenized but maybe maybe a bit of like uh exoticism maybe where like uh, yeah like a pedestal or something yeah on a pedestal kind of thing. yeah and you've seen that happen with me before where in fact people that um uh i don't know what you call them but just people that are really struggling with seeing, and you helped me a lot with this too, Meg. Um, people that are really struggling with seeing the encampments and 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 having like really emotional reactions to seeing encampments, um, and having my name come up as they're like, "Well, I saw this comedian, mm-hmm. and he got out of it, and mm-hmm. and it, why can't they?" And it's so strange because they're trying, they're saying like, "This guy figured it out," but what I'm saying right now is like, I didn't figure anything out. Like it wasn't right. like. Uh, I still don't have it figured out. Like I yeah. still, to this day, have no idea what what snapped that morning, and how hard it, like, because you know what's weird is like I, I tell folks like I woke up June tenth two thousand eight. I was under a tarp in front of the Capitol Theater, and uh, I saw a lady walking her dog, and like something snapped. Like something seriously, like something snapped in my head. Mm-hmm. Like honestly, like it was, it could have been, it could have been a mini stroke or something. I have no idea. <laughs> like I don't know. Yeah. Um, and the the folks, if there was a way that like, if people do want to get sober or whatever, and there are people that like are like me that where they're they're them being unhoused is tied into substance use disorders and things like that. Like it plays a part of their story. Yeah. You know, much like people that are housed, you know. Um, but there's no there's no way right now to to really do that efficiently. There's no way to do that. Um, honestly, there's no way to do that ethically to like try to bring about that. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? That was kind of yeah. a long convoluted answer. but No, no, no. It's all so good. I. I, I'm like, where did you go when you woke up? Did, is that when you went to your mom's house? Yeah, you, you know what's wild? Oh, man. So I, uh, my mom lived out in Lacey, um, out by, by Yelm Highway and Ruddle Road out there. And uh, I just walked to my mom's house. I walked um, up Capitol, down Boulevard. Or no, up, up Pacific, down Boulevard um, to Yelm Highway and uh walked down Yelm Highway and I just cried the whole time I just uh I was just absolutely terrified because it's a thing where like the feeling that I had that morning wasn't that um wasn't that I wanted to be sober the feeling that I had was that I couldn't I couldn't do it anymore 
mm-hmm. that I couldn't keep I couldn't keep juggling those balls anymore. Yeah. And so I was uh, I was thinking about hurting myself, and it was like this thing. It's like either I'm gonna get sober, or I'm gonna or I'm gonna not. And then I remember I I uh, I knocked on you know I knocked on my mom's door and and she'd heard it before, and I wanted her to believe me that it was different, but there's no way I could have made her believe me yeah. that this time was different. I'd probably done this 50 times. I don't even know. But I knew it was different. And I told her, I said, I don't want to, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to be down there anymore. I just want to like, and um, having her in my life to, uh, to help me with that, like, uh, is the difference. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's like, I always really struggle when people are like, what, what was it for you? Like, what was it that changed or what was it? Cause I, it, that same, I just resonate so much with what you're saying of like, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there was like a switch in my brain. I remember certain moments, but there's just that moment of clarity that comes. And I think that that's true for people in any kind of crisis situation, but we just continuously like make substance use this other category that's like can't be combined. Like I I was doing this um, training with some nurses and doctors in at Harborview and trying to talk about harm reduction, the idea of harm reduction and how they're all already experts on it. Right. Because we've decided as a society that something as, completely insane as like barreling down a highway in a box of tin with wheels that could fall off yeah is like something that's a necessity in our society and yet we make it safe we've done all these things to make it safer right because we've decided but and like all of medicine is based on this idea of managing illnesses or preventing illnesses or providing real information so that people can make safer choices. But when we try to apply that to something like clean needles for somebody who's using drugs, it like feels different and it hits different, even though it's all of the exact same principles. Right. And, and like, I think about that, that like that idea of just like the moment of clarity that so many people, whether they've been high on methamphetamines for days or, you know, been an injection heroin user or whatever can relate to yeah well there's a you know so my so i adhd like Mm -hmm. bad and dyslexia and um and trauma and there's a lot of other things i am outside of somebody with a substance use disorder but it's weird the minute i started using methamphetamine all that shit went right out the window i said the swear word sorry uh all that stuff went right out the window uh as far as like it's so funny because I actually have a joke where I'm like, uh, yeah, outside of, you know, being a, an ADHD, but the minute I started doing meth, I guess that was gone. <laughs> We're like, oh, yeah, he's not hyper. He's a tweaker. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, I tend to think these days, and it's funny because I think that more and more it's been backed up now by science about uh, co-occurring disorders and whatnot. So. Yeah. Um, there is a very good chance that I have an anxiety disorder and there is a very good chance that I have at least some mild, um, depression. Yeah. And, uh, I do know that I do have substance use disorder. Like I, I have a, you know, polysubstance. So, so alcohol, um, is the key to the whole thing for me, basically. So if I don't drink, I won't use crystal meth. Yeah. Uh, And I can't smoke weed because if I smoke weed, it makes me want to drink. Right. So that's how I got rah, 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 Mr. Abstinence. Like that, that, that works for me. But the, like you're talking about, I don't have, um, I can't separate the, cause the, if I have an anxiety disorder, it makes me want to get high. Yeah. If I have trauma, it makes me want to get high. And luckily for me, like, um, I do do like 12 step recovery Mm -hmm. stuff like I, and, 
and I love it and I'm a huge advocate for it. If it works for folks, by all means, like, like jump on it. And if you haven't tried it and you want to try it, like give it a shot. You, who knows? Maybe it'll work. Yeah. Cause for me, like having that, um, going into a room of other folks that are, um, not using, um, for me is a, is, is almost a spiritual experience in itself. Um, and that's what, that's what saved my bacon. And also having like a, a structure for, I don't want to, I don't know the right way to say this, but almost having like a framework for thinking about like, yeah. uh, about who I am and, and how I should live my life and, and, and learning how to, um, for so long I, I avoided so many things and rightfully so I had a lot of stuff that I should be avoiding. Like I, I was raised in a, in a household, like we were middle class, but I had a, I had a dad that he was something else. Like I love the guy to death, but he was wild mm-hmm. and, um, and, and passed away when I was young, you know, and, and he grew up in a, in a, a beautiful town called Spanaway that wasn't, wasn't very nice at all. Yeah. And, uh, that it, it does, it can work and it does work. And, uh, and, but without a doubt, like, uh, see, I'm doing that thing where I'm like meandering, but, uh, without a doubt, like having the, having my mom, mm-hmm. um, being white, mm-hmm. uh, uh, being like, middle like like when you're raised in middle class like i speak middle class people don't realize this but there's like different yeah types of language like you guys heard me today like i can i can i can speak different languages Mm -hmm. like i can because i spent a lot of time locked up and like like i can speak i could talk like that i I wouldn't work well for this podcast but uh (laughs) i can (laughs) you know what i mean like uh and i've gone to college now and I can speak like that and do like evergreen seminar and reframe and freaking <laughs> all that crap. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I live a, you know, I, I talked a lot about guilt, but I, I don't, uh, I live a beautiful life. I'm, 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 I still struggle mm-hmm. um, with, uh, with those feelings, but I have a system that works for me yeah. to, to get through that. Yeah, I think that, so for me, I, well, we all often like talk about the spectrum of recovery and like that ideas of harm reduction or people who are in active, chaotic, active addiction, there's still like interventions that are on the path of recovery that mm-hmm. can, that can exist. And that that's not in any way at odds with what you're talking about with mm-hmm. 12 step model. It's all part of a spectrum and like getting creative of how we meet people exactly where they're at and believe that their life is like worth enough to do something to support them in that moment. And I think for me, I went to a traditional like rehab, inpatient rehab that was very much based on 12 steps and came out of that, um, really like I n- I didn't ever quite connect in the same way that you did. I think that there are like a lot of lessons that I've learned through that experience that are amazing life lessons that have helped me in my relationships, helped yeah. me be more honest with myself and more honest with the people around me. Um, but I didn't maintain in that place of 12 steps because there were things missing there for me. And I think that I had a lot more to do with my mental health recovery and how suicidality was tied really closely to my addiction as well. And I think that part of the like moment of clarity in my life was believing that I, that I didn't actually want to die anymore and that I was worth enough that these amazing relationships I had in my life with my family and with friends and artists and musicians that I had kind of come to know and love throughout my active addiction, um, that I was like a worthy person of all of that kind of love. And, and it's like a huge thing to accept and, and something that I work on all the time. And so now, so I was fully abstinent for five years and I do drink alcohol now, but I, how dare you? I know, but I, 
very much am danger to the community <laughs> <I'm> still <laughs> like in active recovery every day and i think that that's something that i that is a nuance that i don't know if our community really understands that it truly does look different for every person what a road into addiction and what a road out of addiction looks like and if we want to actually do something about an addiction crisis in our society which I hope that we actually do want to do that um we're going to have to get a lot more expansive in our minds and in our hearts about like what that means yeah and so I'm not addressing this to the maybe move completely out of when we're talking about unhoused folks and that like substance use disorders as a whole and I I couldn't agree with you more um <clears throat> and it's funny because like the kind of people like you like uh Malika Lamont like mm-hmm. uh like I'm trying to think of other folks back in the day at Bread and Roses mm-hmm. um the people that were extremely kind to me while I was going through like that that struggle and I don't know how much people knew about you know like I use that analogy of juggling those balls and the compassion that was shown to me was shown to me by a lot of the folks that were practicing the tenets of harm reduction. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> what's strange to me, I think I've talked to you about this a few times, but that um, abstinence, the my practice, and even um, 12-step abstinence, um, to me fits perfectly within the realm of harm reduction. Yeah. What could reduce more harm than me not doing anything at all. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Cause, yeah. cause I am one of those cats. Like I don't have uh like, it's funny cause you brought up the fact like, um, like the, the, I know that about myself and I knew that back then too. Like I always tell this story about me and alcohol, like, uh, where I was locked up mm-hmm. and I was in, uh, I was in Thurston County jail for resisting arrest, theft three, probation violations, the huge, you know. Uh, I always wanted to wrestle the cops. I thought they wanted to wrestle. <laughs> uh, I never heard them, but they, they hurt me a couple of times. Anyway, uh, I remember being in jail. I think I've told you this story before, but I was like, I'm like, I'm in jail, and I'm like, like, I am not drinking again, man. Forget it. Like, I'm not drinking. And it's like the whole, like, you know, we were talking about clean before. Uh-huh. It's the funniest thing, too, because there's people coming into the, the jail and they're like, do you want to check out, like, some rehab classes? Do you want to do this when you get out? And I'm like, no, I'm never going to drink again. Like, I don't need any help. Yeah. I already decided that I'm not drinking anymore. Yeah. So leave me alone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I got this. Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, I, I got, I got, like, two weeks left on my sentence. And I'm like, here we go. I can't wait to get out. I'm going to go get a job. I'm going to go. I was going to join the military because I thought nobody drinks in the military, which is weird thinking to me. But, uh, yeah, I wanted to fight for freedom or something. And uh, the jail was crowded. And so I had two weeks left, and somebody came in. They are like, Miller, court. And I'm like, crap. Like, I thought maybe there was another charge or, like, yeah. something like that. And I was going to get locked up for longer. But it was, it was an early release hearing because the jail was crowded. And I remember being like, I remember being in the courtroom and them coming in and being like, you're getting out. And in that moment, all that other thoughts about like, I was Mm -hmm. like, man, I need to celebrate tonight. Like I am (laughs) getting out of jail. I'm going to the, I'm going to Wilson street. Like, like I was partying at this black house on Wilson street and, uh, and it was so weird because you talk about like moments of clarity. Like I had other moments of clarity before I got before I got sober yeah. on, in 2008. And I remember I'm laying in the yard staring at the stars. My ex-girlfriend who who was messing with a friend of mine while I was locked up. Like well she wasn't my she was my girlfriend when I got locked up, but then I guess she was seeing somebody else for a while, but then I guess she was my girlfriend again. Uh, it was weird. It was just full circle. I was doing poly stuff before it was cool. Uh, <laughs> but it was way, it was crazy because like you get out of jail and it's like, I want to get high. I want to have sex. I want to like, I want to live my fullest life and it's all happening right now. So I'm laying in this yard. I'm drunk. I'm high. Uh, she's like straddling me. I'm in this yard. And I'm staring at the sky, and I just felt like I was doomed. 
Yeah. And I couldn't figure out how I had gone from uh, somebody who was going to, like, get get sober and, like, figure things out to somebody who was right back. And I knew that, like, and once I started, I wasn't going to stop. And once I started, I knew eventually, um, eventually I was going to get into it with, with law enforcement and I was going to get locked up again. Yeah. And I was locked up again two weeks later. And I yeah. hated jail so much, but I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't untangle who I was from substances, yeah. you know, and, uh, that's why I don't drink. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? Well, and I think what I'm really thinking about right now too, is just how close it all still is, even though, and that's true for me too. Like we, so I was talking with Sam last night and we've talked about it before, but there's a lot, you know, in nonprofit world, a lot of times we'll want to like share client success stories or there's a lot of pressure from funders or grants that you write to sort of show, you know, the the fruits of all of the work that you've it's done. Written and it's, it's written so into grants. It's written into grants. and Client like, success story. And yeah, client like success story. There, you know. And and like putting clients on a pedestal in a way and the folks that we work with in a way to really live into that sort of societal pressure of like becoming a contributing member of society, getting a job, getting sober, um, getting on medication for mental health, like whatever those things are like, and there's all this pressure to sort of share those stories regularly. And it has a really intense impact on the people who are sharing their stories. And there's been um, some more kind of like emerging research that's been happening about um, correlation of relapse on um, challenges that folks are going through when they are sharing their story publicly, particularly when it's linked to fundraising activities for different organizations. And so we're really sensitive to that at Interfaith Works. Um, and I think in my own life, like I did that TEDx talk many years ago and the opening line um, for that is, you know, I had my first psychotic break at the age of whatever, you know, like that's how I opened it up in, in at the Washington Center for the Performing Arts in front of 900 people. And at the time, it and now still, it was really a cool experience to be able to be that open and that free with it. But I felt so exposed for like months afterwards and sort of like oh no kind of what have I done you know in this way and I think that it spoke to a lot of people and our a lot of our shelter guests were there and it was really meaningful to them to be there but it's just this like very real and close thing still like the same way that you tear up talking about those moments like that's how I feel when my brother told me that he didn't feel safe leaving me, leaving his kids alone with me. Yeah, That's like Sam, my, not Sam, yeah. my nephew, Sam, who's it's like my day. love, <laughs> like my pride and joy of like all of life. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, I wasn't allowed to be alone with him for a while. And, and like <sighs> over time that just changes and that trust there, there was a moment I had been sober two years and my br brother was, um, finishing graduate school and it was all this like kind of hustle and bustle and everybody was like my mom's going to do this chore and my or this like errand and my brother has to do this thing and da, da, da. and all of a sudden it was like and Meg you'll stay with Sam and then the door closed to the apartment and I was alone with him in the apartment and I was like wait this is just okay now that that no we hadn't ever had a conversation we hadn't ever and I yeah. was just like I almost had to like panic because I was like oh my god I'm like trusted to be alone with him now, you know? And it was this like, but that took like years to get to a place of, of all of that. And, and I, yeah, I just, I feel like we could talk to each other about this forever because, and I would just wish that more conversations like this could happen in my, the public square. <laughs> my mom gave me a key to her house when I was like, I think it was like, I'd been sober like a year and a half or something. And like, I remember like, I, I, uh, I was like calling people. I was like, because like, uh, I mean, I, 
you know, I was a thief. I, I took stuff. Like, I, because mm-hmm. I was, like, to me, getting getting drugs was life or death, you know, like it was. And, yeah, I do. Um, I mean, obviously, like, I'm getting emotional when I talk about some of this stuff. And it does take take it out of me. But I have a system in place. We talked about that last night, mm-hmm. too, because I knew this was going to happen. And I have a system in place for when I leave here to make sure that I take care of myself, you know. And there's a reason that I think it's important that I do this, but I would never put this on anybody else to do this and to talk about this stuff all in a row like this. And honestly, nobody else, uh, nobody, I don't I don't owe anybody anything. Like, yeah. Uh, I don't owe anybody anything. Like, I like doing stand-up and, and making jokes about it. That's different than this, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Uh, that's different than this because uh, I guess it's impossible. Um, it's impossible to not be vulnerable and be honest at the same time. Do you know what I mean? Like I can't. Yeah. I can't be honest without being without being vulnerable about this, and I I can't um, I can't think about it without getting emotional because uh, the I compare it to it to a, to a, to, to storms. And it's strange because I love thunderstorms, um, mm-hmm. but um, until your until your house is underwater, you know, and that's uh, that's what it was, you know, just yeah. like everything, everything in my life um, for a long period of time was uh, was un what's the word? Everything was on the line. Mm-hmm every day yeah you know whether that was whether i was looking at incarceration or or overdose or Mm -hmm. uh any of that stuff you know yeah i'm doing fine though by the way i'm okay oh i know yeah you know know. i'm fine i know um i'm not gonna go smoke meth after this oh i know well maybe a little bit (laughs) (laughs) Can I just, just do a little, a little, little bit? bit of meth? Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I've never been able to do a little bit of meth. Yeah. I remember being like, I'm just going to do a little bit of meth. And I'd be like, okay, I think I'm going to do like a medium amount. <laughs> medium amphetamine. <laughs> okay, not the most I've ever done. Yeah. Just, yeah. You're like, I'm not going to get wild. No, no. <laughs> yeah. And then like two days later, I'm like, like talking on a cell phone. I found a cell phone. I was up for three days one time, and I found a I found a cell phone. Ever tell you this story? No. And I thought they were trying to recruit me into the CIA because oh, I was yeah. having a psychotic <laughs> break. And this guy's like, "Sam, give me back my phone." And I was like, "What does this mean?" Click. <laughs> <laughs> it's just my friend Will's phone. <laughs> it was weird. <laughs> yeah, he was really mad at me. I threw it in the bay. Mm. I was like, I don't want to be in the CIA. <laughs> <I> <laughs> they'll never my find mind. me now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll never find me now. Well, Sam, is there anything else that you that you feel is on your heart or your mind about this no, subject? We talked about, I mean, it is the uh, overdose day. Um, like, obviously, both me and you have lost a uh, a lot of people mm-hmm. to overdose you know what's strange is that i didn't talk to you about this but like uh anymore most of the people i know that have um passed away due to overdose a lot of times they're people that i met in recovery mm-hmm. that um that go back out that relapse and, and go back out yeah and uh that's hard um it's strange when it happens because usually it takes me a couple days for it to like hit me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it still, it still hits me that hard. And you know, what's weird too, is it, um, along with overdose, I also tie in like friends of mine that have died from, um, suicide and friends of mine that have died from like homicide. Yeah. Um, yeah. And tied in too. Yeah. So, uh, and also, I, I mean, it's a violent death. Violent yeah. death, you know, yeah. And I grieve a lot for people I know that are doing um, long stints in prison. Yeah. Because I don't get to see them anymore either. Yeah. Know? And uh, 
but I don't think, I think, you know, I think I covered, I don't know. Yeah. I think that what I'm, what I'm feeling is on my heart and my mind is just like so much gratitude for you spending time with me today and being here and just that. Okay. Two things in closing. One is that I also think it's that things are a little bit different than when we were using to just particularly, and I want the community to like hear this just particularly with the intense rise in fentanyl and carfentanyl that's in, um, not only opiates, but also in everything now. So people who at one point thought that methamphetamine like we I remember there were lots of folks who were like oh I don't do heroin because it's too dangerous there's too much risk of overdose and a lot of times folks would do methamphetamines and there was sort of this kind of misunderstanding even in harm reduction world that you couldn't really overdose on methamphetamine or you couldn't really overdose on cocaine it was always something else that occurred like a brain aneurysm or a heart attack or I think that yeah And there was in some ways truth to that. Like Mm -hmm. it wasn't as um, primary of a thing like respiratory depression is, like how you stop breathing when you overdose from an opiate. But um, any more now, there's fentanyl in everything. And so when people like what you're talking about, and this was, you know, true for my cousin's experience was that he had had like a long period of sobriety and used once like that idea of like, I'm just going to do this one time just a little bit. And, um, it's really, it's just something that our community really needs to know about. I think. Yeah. It's not, um, it isn't like what it used to be. I, uh, I worked, you know, outside of working in like homeless services the last few years, um, oh, fuck, five years or whatever now. But I uh, worked at a methadone clinic for a long time in uh, medication-assisted therapy is what I should call it. But uh, I'm still working out the lingo sometimes. Uh, yeah, it was a different deal altogether. You know, the methamphetamine that I did, like, I knew where it came from. I know it sounds weird. Yeah. It was artisanal. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, fair trade. It was uh, locally brewed. Locally brewed. <laughs> I used to um, I used to smurf back then. I don't know if you know that or not, but I used to go around and buy ephedrine from the stores uh-huh. and take it out to cats I knew that were cooking it and stuff like that. Yeah. And like, uh, and it was different than it is now. Now I I don't know. Like, I guess most of it's coming from Mexico now because it's so hard to get um, ephedrine mm-hmm. and uh, anything any substance i mean we're having issues i was working in in high schools for a while and they have a hell of a time because um benzos have become like a more and more a popular drug of abuse um and uh they make benzos and pill presses so they get other types of benzos they put them in a pill press they put a little bit of fentanyl on it because um it's all about so fentanyl any any sort of opiate mixed with another drug Opiate is synergistic with almost any substance. Yeah. So a uh, you put fentanyl, it's like one plus one equals three. So yeah. you can put less of the benzo in a pill, make it yourself, put a tiny bit of fentanyl in there, and the person you take is going to be like, wow, this is great. But then what happens is that if then if then if that person drinks on top of that, mm-hmm. like that's the number one for young people is the combination. For mm-hmm. overdoses, it's it's generally a combination mm-hmm. of drugs, and I and I do hear about fentanyl, methamphetamine, and also the thing too is that there's a methamphetamine epidemic right now too yeah. that we don't talk about. You know, yeah, that methamphetamine is stronger and cheaper than it's been in a very long time, and um, there's all kinds of people that get caught up with it. You know, and the thing about it too is that um, I always talk about methamphetamine as a if you are unhoused. And especially if you're if you're staying someplace, if your sleeping situation isn't the safest, it's a perfect drug mm-hmm. for that because you can you can you can set your sleep schedule. You yeah. Know? Like, all right, I'm gonna sleep 12 hours here instead of trying to sleep eight hours at night in someplace where I'm not safe. Yeah. You know. So. Yeah. 
Totally. And I think that there's a hierarchy of what we accept and tolerate in our society when it comes to substances like caffeine, yeah, widely accepted, yeah, alcohol, widely accepted, yeah. you know, there, and then we start to get down to the hierarchy of like, and now opiates are kind of more widely accepted because there's been more awareness that has grown and about middle class white opiate use predominantly. And so it's become a little more accepted. Right. And you keep whittling that away and methamphetamines are still at a highly stigmatized place in our society. And so I'm really glad that, that you mentioned that. I do want to say also, um, that we really encourage every single person to get trained to administer naloxone or Narcan. And that is a non-narcotic prescription drug, but there's open scripts um, through Walgreens, through um, Sammy's Pharmacy and Lacey, through other places where anyone through the passing of the Good Samaritan Law many years ago is legally able to carry and administer Narcan in the event of an opiate overdose. Um, we provide trainings on that, so please get in touch. Um, there are also all kinds of online trainings that are really accessible to anybody who's interested. I had the other day a person walk up my street and overdosed in front of my house on my street. Never seen him before, never been in my neighborhood before, worked at a place around the corner, and I was like, wow, you really picked the right house yeah. to have this experience at. But it can literally happen anywhere, um, and we all need to be vigilant as a community if we really want to address um, addiction crisis, which I think most people in our community really do. I keep my Narcan in a first aid kit in my car. Yeah. And if you have a real first aid kit and you don't have Narcan, it ain't a real first aid kit because uh, I've seen more people be saved with Narcan than I've ever seen with one of them big weird Band-Aids. <laughs> <laughs> the gauze with no tape. Yeah, I don't know what <laughs> yeah. you can do with that. Just shove that in there. And you got a hole. I don't get it. I'm not a doctor. Yeah, you do <laughs> use big words. Huh? You do use big words mm-hmm. today, though. Yeah, like yeah. I can't remember any of them. I think I said. Uh, what did I say? Bamboozle. Oh, I love saying bamboozled. I say that all the time. You but I didn't say bamboozled. I said bombastic. Oh, you did? Yeah. I don't okay. use the word bamboozled. Ostracization? Ostracization. <laughs> That's, you know, I had a friend who was ostracized and his neck got very long and he drew wings. <laughs> he was ostracized. <laughs> I had another friend that was flamingoed and it was the same thing, but he turned pink. What do you think? Is that good stuff? You like that, Miguel? We're just trying out some bits. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. This is this is gold. I wonder if this stuff will ever see stage. Can I yeah. tell my couple meth jokes? Yeah. Wait. Let me just finish my last heartfelt thing, and then let's go into meth jokes. Okay. Okay. My last heartfelt thing is that if you are struggling with addiction, whatever it is, please know that you are a worthy person. And you don't have to hide in the shame spiral we've been there we've hidden in that we've been buried by that and you don't have to do that find one person whether it's online or in real life that you can confide in what you're doing and be honest and open because you deserve freedom from your pain and we love you so much there are so many different types of substance use disorder stuff there's so many levels that it can get people at. Um, and there is all of those. Like, the treatment industry is so much better than it used to be. Like, there's so m- the inpatient facilities are so much better than they used to be. And it's so much easier to get in them now than it used to be. So there is treatment available. It's not great, but mm-hmm. it is better. So Yeah. I didn't mean to... No, you're good. Your thunder, because you were like closed really strong. And I was like, <laughs> "Yo, it makes it." <laughs> All right, so okay, take good. us, take us out, take us home. Okay, um, I'm just gonna tell them to you, okay. and then you be like, "You're like uh, my straight man." That's what they call that, which is a weird thing to call Meg Martin. Uh, <laughs> so I'll be a straight uh, man. Yeah, Let's be do a it. straight man. <laughs> That's great. You'd be president. <laughs> uh, every president's been a straight man, or so we think. Yeah. 
or so they say. I think Taft like dudes. <laughs> 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 Name like Taft anyway. Um, what is the best part of smoking meth at light bulbs? What? It's dark. Nobody can see you. <laughs> 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 you know. Smoking meth during the holidays was always hard for me. You know why? Why? Uh, I have this such big hands, and it's so hard to smoke meth out of those little Christmas lights. <laughs> 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 you know, it was crazy. I used to have a drinking problem. It was really oh, yeah? bad. You know the craziest thing? One night, you know what I did when I was drinking one night? What? I smoked meth for eight years. <laughs> 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 Whoa, what was I thinking? <laughs> you know the, the best way? To get out of jury duty? What? It's to be the defendant. <laughs> <laughs> but it'd be sweet if they would have let me be on the jury. <laughs> I don't think he's guilty. <laughs> I mean, look at him. I think he should go. Just go home. I got summoned to jury duty. Like recently? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of telling on myself. Hope the county comes after me. I'm ready. I'm waiting. Come at me, Snazza. Is that his name? Is that the sheriff? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Actually, don't, Snazza. I really like you. <laughs> don't come after me. <laughs> I'm so bad at lying. <laughs> That's all. That's all my meth jokes. Thank you, Sam. Actually, I have a lot more meth jokes than that, but I don't want to do it. But anymore. where could people see more of your meth jokes next? Instagram. Follow me, Sam Miller Comedian. I'm trying to do better at Instagram, but also Sam Miller um, Comedy on Facebook. I am headed... On the road. Cool. Here. I'm going to Portland on Thursday, Eureka, California on Saturday. And then in two weeks, I'm going to Denver, Colorado. Cool. The Denver Comedy Underground. And I'm doing a recovery show in Salt Lake City on the way down there. And, uh, yeah, I'm around. I stay up. So. Well, you have so much love here, not only in this room, but in Thank this you. town. We all are rooting for you. Thank you so much for spending your morning with me. Does this I really make you want it. a corn dog, too? <laughs> <laughs> I'm vegan. Yeah. I'm Vegan starving. corn dog. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> vegan from day one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another thing we have in common. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No meat for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for tuning in to Lena and Olympia. Huge shout out always to Porcupine Media and we'll see you next time.